Hello, everyone, and welcome to our weekly discussion series that's hosted by the Chaldean Cultural Center in collaboration with U of M Detroit Center, Unique Voices and Films, and CMN TV. I'm your host, we am Neymoum, and our guest today is Elise Elusi. Hello, Elise. Good morning, Liam. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so glad that you were able to join us today. Um, I know that you have a new book that I'm so excited to talk about today. But first, um, well, the book is called What to Count, which was published in August 2023 by Wayne State University Press. So congratulations for that. Um, but Elise is a 2019 Kresge Literary Arts Fellow and has received awards and fellowships from the Knight Foundation, Mesa Refugee, Martha's Vineyard Institute of Creative Writing and others. She has worked at in and out Literary Arts in Detroit for two decades and has taught in the past poetry through the Arab American National Museum's Teen Writing Fellows Program. So you've been involved in the literary world for quite a while. Yes, definitely. Definitely. I feel really fortunate to have this beautiful community um, that we have in Metro Detroit of writers and artists. And by the way, I want to mention that we are having an event, um, a poetry event at West Bloomfield Library on Saturday, April 13th um, at 1 p.m., where it's going to be myself and you and Dunya Mikhail and um, Lamis. Yeah, Lamis, I just interviewed her recently. Sorry. Lamise, um, I'll just have a little bit more coffee here. <laughs> Um, so we're having a poetry event that we were just discussing was intended years ago was before the pandemic it was scheduled and because of the pandemic we couldn't go through with it but then now we are we're having it again so it, it's um and it should be wonderful because we're going to be reading our poetry and there's a documentary that we're all in um about Iraqi born women poets Correct. So yes. Yeah, I'm so excited that we're able to make that happen and grateful to you and to the West Bloomfield Library for having us. Thank you. Um, so let's start with where um, you were born, Elise, and how uh, what was it like growing up as an Iraqi American? Yeah, definitely. Well, my trajectory has been a little bit here and there. Mm -hmm. I was born um, in Cleveland, Ohio, um, and moved to Detroit as a young person, and then had a couple of periods when I was quite young where we lived in Iraq. Oops. Are you still there? You did live in Iraq. How long did you live there for? We lived there for a year, and I actually went to school there when I was quite young in the first grade, and then we lived there another time for uh, just for the summer. So what, what memories do you have of that? You know, I have beautiful memories. The last time I was actually there was in um, 1996, actually, during the economic sanctions. So a very different experience to go back as an adult with my dad and my sisters and have time with family. So that's the one that lives most recently in my memory is that trip during the 90s. Um, but as a child, yeah, I went to a school, El Mansur School, um, had a beautiful experience there. It's an international school. It still exists. I believe. Um, and so um, there were the kind of English speaking part of the school, which was made up of, um, you know, families from Europe and the States and other parts of the world. And then the Iraqi speaking side, the Arabic speaking side. And so we would come together for different events and things like that. I always regret that I learned in English because um, I never learned Arabic, which is really still something that I feel quite sad about. Mm -hmm. Wow. So I was also, uh, I, I mean, I was born in Baghdad and I went to school there, but I left early. I left at age nine and came to the United States. Wow. Um, but I also went back during the sanctions in 2000. And that, like you mentioned, is a totally different experience from when I was young and growing up. And it, it was a very sad state um, during that time. Um, but so when you started, uh, when did you start writing poetry? And I'm curious because since you did live in Iraq for a little while, how that influenced you <clears throat> as a poet, um, how much of that was kind of coming forward? 
Yes, I'm so sorry. My dog is barking, and I'm okay. I anybody that knows me knows I love dogs so much. Okay. She's bark a, only bark <laughs> and she'll only she'll only bark for another couple of minutes, hopefully. What kind of dog you know, do you have? She's a, a cocker spaniel poodle mix. So, oh. <laughs> um, Luna, so sorry. Yeah, I well, so I primarily grew up in Detroit, and I would say I grew up in a community without. It was extremely diverse area of the city, but not an area with a lot of other Arab Americans or Arab families. Um, and so I grew up going to school in Detroit. I went to Wayne State University and really met a lot of amazing artists and activists from that community. Um, but Iraq and my experience as an Iraqi American has always been part of what I write about, what I think about. Um, and so it's definitely in, influenced my writing, um, both sort of the um, challenges of navigating as somebody who is half something and half something else. My mother is American. My father, like I said, was born in Iraq and came here to finish his education. So that sort of space that um, we exist in when we feel a strong allegiance to our heritage, but that's not fully who we are, I would say has some is something that has definitely impacted my writing. And then just aspects of the history and culture of Iraq, for sure, um, like we talked about um, during the sanctions. I was very involved with other um, people in the Arab and, and Chaldean community and others in, in trying to um, bring aware, awareness to that issue, um, which was so devastating um, for people in Iraq. And so it's always ever present in my mind, I would say for sure. So by the way, um, when your dog was barking, my dog had started to join in. I muted <laughs> And I thought, you know what, maybe they want to join in this interview or something yes. like that. Yes. Um, we, I, I don't know, I, I often talk about how people that have any connection to Iraq, whether, you know, they're only one of their parents was born in Iraq, whether they both parents were or even grandparents and, and they were born here. There's that connection that Everybody has. I, I know a couple of people that I'm talking to right now who were born here and their the passion for their roots, understanding their roots and just having that feeling towards it. Um, and I think part of that is just Iraq is just an amazingly rich, well, it's very rich with history, Correct. so rich with culture, so rich with... Um, I would even say diversity, you know, especially in the past. We, When you look back, there's so many people, for instance, there's people that I met who traced their roots. They said, oh, well, we traced our roots. We were Chaldeans. And they've embraced that openly and love it. And I thought, well, this is so beautiful that people there can just be of different backgrounds and embrace their um, their different heritage. And But the people even here, I think it's very hard to forget that that's our those are our roots, even as we embrace the, the wonderful um, world that we live in as Americans. Um, and for you, I, I know that, you know, working, you've worked at Inside Out Literary Arts um, in Detroit for two decades. That's a long time. Um, and that's a wonderful, wonderful place to be in. <laughs> um, so what is your role in this organization? And do, what does working there mean to you? Oh, that's a beautiful question. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, I've worked at Inside Out for quite a while. Um, for anyone who doesn't know, we're a Detroit-based nonprofit uh, literary arts organization. So we bring creative writing into schools throughout Metro Detroit. And then we also have an award-winning after-school program for teens called Citywide Poets. And then we offer a variety of programs in the community as well. So we work with older adults. We work with um, other organizations who serve young people to bring in opportunities for people to write and express themselves. My role there is as um, school and community program director. So that means I get to plan amazing events in the community that expose new audiences to poetry and to our mission. Um, and I also get to work directly with school districts throughout the Metro Detroit area that bring our program in 
in. Um, and one of the really unique things about Inside Out Literary Arts, and we're coming up on our 30th year um, of being in existence, um, is that we really believe in acknowledging the voices of young people. So we publish um, school literary journals in every school that we're in. We offer young people opportunities to perform their poetry at events. Um, we just had a young person who read an original poem that she wrote at the groundbreaking ceremony for a new park on the Detroit Riverfront. So we really try to uplift youth voice and make sure that they are part of the conversations, the really important conversations that are happening across the region. Um, you know, I want to ask you, how do you, have you observed since you've been there for so long, um, how does allowing them to have a voice, the youth, mm -hmm. how have you from observation seen that that helps them or changes them even? Oh, absolutely. I think what happens sometimes, um, I think, you know, we all have a voice. It's, it's more like in which ways and in, in what opportunities do you have to express yourself? And I think sometimes when young people feel they are not a typical A student, um, they might feel like they can't express themselves or they can't use their voice because maybe they don't have the traditional tools um, to be able to do so. But through poetry, through creative writing, when they have an opportunity to really write about what matters to them or what they're interested in and express themselves creative, creatively, they often realize they do have talents, they do have skills, they have opportunities. Um, we have quite a number of students who have received scholarships. Um, we offer a scholarship every year to a student in our after school program. So many of our um, students go on to pursue uh, opportunities uh, that include writing. So whether they choose to go on and become a poet or they're working in the fields of journalism or marketing. Um, and then we have other people who've come through our program and have found it really beneficial, but they're now engineers or architects or lawyers. Um, but I think we all know that no matter what um, path we take in life, an opportunity and an understanding of the value of self-expression, how to stand up in front of an audience of people and share your opinions and your ideas is something that you need for the rest of your life, both in college um, as well as in, in a work setting. Yeah, I totally, of course, I mean, for me as a writer, I totally believe in that. But I also have been in situations, I mean, you know, where we came from, it wasn't, um, you're not encouraged so much to be so expressive. And I see how detrimental that is when you don't have those opportunities. So I've seen the other side and I am so grateful that um, I think Westerners have given me uh, so many platforms to express myself, to express my writing. And it wasn't until much later in life that I thought that uh, how significant that is to certain healings um, that take place that you think like writing is just, oh, you're expressing yourself, but there's a lot of healing that and growth that ha happens by the ability to do so. Um, so you're the inside out. I mean, that how, how do you, what's the website? I know that I can't share it right here. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. Inside yeah. out. Is it just inside out.org? It's inside out Detroit.org. Okay. Yes. And so people, we have an events page where we list upcoming events. Um, we're getting ready to do a huge conference for teens at Wayne State University on March 9th. Um, so if there are any young people or families who are listening right now and you have a young person who's interested in writing, it's free. It's open to any teen, 13 to 19. Um, Ross Gay is our um, keynote. He's an amazing writer um, that we're fortunate to be bringing to Detroit. And we'll also have him um, presenting in the evening and people are welcome to buy tickets just for that portion of the event. Um, and so, yeah, I encourage people to look at our website and get familiar with what we do for sure. Well, thank you for all your work, but also thanks to Inside Out for all these programmings and for being around for 30 years. That says a lot. So um, now let's get to your book, which is, it's a book of poetry, What to um, Count. And it was, as I mentioned earlier, published by Wayne State University Press. So can you um, read us a couple of poems from there, about three?
be poems. We would love to hear your For sure. Reading. Yeah, my pleasure. Um, let's see. I think I will um, start with a poem that I actually wrote for Dunya McHale, who um, is a dear friend to both of us um, and who's reading with us at the, at the library. Um, she's somebody who is just known the world over for her writing um, and is somebody that I'm fortunate to have come to know um, and just really admire her as a human being and as a writer. So this is called The Poem for Dunya. There was a poem I started, it had one good leg, the one that seemed to want to run, the one that had no shoes, the poem that went its own way and never came back, the poem I lost, and the one that resurfaced between breaths in the grounds of my coffee, the poem he wanted me to write, or she, or they, the one that everyone hated and kept at a distance. There was the poem that came disguised as spam, the one got stuck in my teeth and no one bothered to tell me. The poem I scraped like burnt toast into the trash. There was the poem that sounded like a bed hitting the wall, the one everyone thought was something else. There was the poem with too many tropes, the one that danced for the wrong audience that expired before we could drink it. There was the one that needed birds or something wet to finish it, the one I ate with the smallest spoon. There was the poem my friend told me, was waiting for me. I saw it in the window, slowly lifted my hand to wave, but the light changed and one of us looked away. This is a poem called Capture the Flag. Um, and it sort of addresses what Weam was asking me about earlier, which is what it was like growing up in Detroit as an Iraqi American. In this game, we try to burn down the house, cooking foreign foods on a holiday no one knows to celebrate. We fumble our way into the bedroom, glass doorknob lost, screwdriver in hand, and sleep curled in one bed, holding forth with the overseas operator. Each word is an echo, punctuated by beeps, seconds ticking into years of missing family. We come from nowhere, from Cleveland, from Baghdad, named for dictators and distant relatives, like shady garden patches full of ineatable vegetables, frying pan still smoldering in a snowbank, round Iraqi sausages charred on a paper napkin. We came to Detroit for a funeral and never left. The all-electric house, ivy smothering bricks, birds nesting in chimneys, perched ourselves on a tree that didn't grow up but out, ran the streets, feet tagging the center island, safe. Games named for actions never fully realized. Capture the flag. Ghost in the graveyard, Marco Polo. The object was always to appeal normal, American, unafraid as doors slamming, borders closing between us and them, language peppered with the wrong words, customs that dissuaded friendships beyond the front porch, flight path forming above roof lines even as it disappeared. That was so beautiful, Elise. Thank you. That was very touching. And that's, I feel like uh, something I, I could really relate. Oh, I'm so glad to hear that. I'm so glad to hear it. Yeah, one of the poems was obviously about the struggle to write sometimes and all of the drafts that we have that we um, come back to or sometimes don't come back to because they're just not working for us. So thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you. That was, and if you have another one, you, there is time. I'd love to, for you to share if you have one more. Sure, absolutely. Um, and uh, this is a guzzle. Um, so you'll notice there's repetition in this poem, and it's called Imitation Spring. I know we were talking a little bit earlier about COVID, and this is a poem that was written during that time. Our daughter was born without a sense of smell in spring came home on the hottest day, a record-breaking spring. At three, she pressed a fistful of lilacs to her face, inhaled hard, an imitation of what it is to smell, what I did at the start of spring, to find flowers were color, texture only, trying embedded in her heart, like this virus too steals all sense, that sudden loss springing, ahead of the other symptoms. There's missing something and there's never having it. She's old enough to know this, her 18th spring. Every sense, a balm and bane, 
hers more pronounced, that pink too bright, hard sound of paper against itself, she lifts from a different spring, memory, a story of want and sound, like those small figures she gathered around her as a child, paused before the story flowered. Now she startles us pre-dawn, breaks her fast alone downstairs, the lunar cycle, dates and yogurt, her ode to this pandemic spring, the condition's name we hear all year, but never speak, echoes of our late insomnia, lost lull, want of sleep. That was lovely. Um, I can't wait until April 13 and we'll be listening to maybe whether you're going to choose these poems or other poems that are going to be read by you and the other poets. So I really encourage um, anybody who's uh, obviously it's a, it's a free event, but I encourage people to come and there's a, a wonderful video, like a mini documentary that's 10 minutes that highlights us that thanks to Dunya um, was, uh, it was through a grant that was funded by the Knights Foundation that was awarded to Dunya and she um, gave us this opportunity. So that was wonderful as well. Uh, you know, you've been involved with the Arab American National Museum for a while. Um, and at some point you taught um, through, you taught poetry to teenagers there. But in general, what relationship has have you had with the Arab American Museum and what was that experience like or is currently? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, I love to talk about the Arab American National Museum. It's one of my favorite places. Um, and actually, before there was an actual physical building to the museum, there was always arts and culture um, opportunities through access. And so when I was a young writer, um, they would bring in folks like Naomi Shihab Nye and Mona Simpson and other writers to come and workshop with us. Um, and that was really a pivotal, important part of my um, experience as a young writer. And so I was just thrilled when they had an opportunity to find the funding to actually open a physical space for the museum. And then I was extra thrilled um, when I was able to teach. I taught two um, sessions of a creative writing fellowship that that is for teens and actually they're offering it again. Um, and so I would encourage any young person who's interested in growing their skills as a writer to um, check out the museum's website. And just in general for folks to be familiar with the opportunities and events that they offer there. But yeah, I, I consider that um, sort of like a home base in a way, the museum. Um, it's just always been an important part of my life. So whether I'm going there for a poetry reading or a film or some kind of an event um, or reading there them myself. Um, I just feel like a sense of home when I'm there. And I think they do remarkable work um, for the community. And I'm so just pleased to have been a part of that shaping who I am as a writer and to see that continue to grow and evolve is just a beautiful thing. Uh, it is very beautiful, and uh, I I want to mention I, I often mention this, but the the importance of uh, the state of Michigan to Middle Easterners in in general, um, well, to everybody, but in particular to <laughs> particularly to Middle Easterners because the Arab American National Museum is the only Arab American museum in the, in the United States. Um, and uh, the Chaldean Museum is the first and only museum in the world. All this in this state. So I think it's, to me, when I hear that, it just feels like it's so like a little Middle East, but in a positive way, because we have opportunities to do these cultural exchanges and um, expressions. And I, I think it's, we do it in a beautiful way. Um, I want to emphasize that because I know there's sometimes some stereotypes or negativities, but it really isn't like that. And there's like this shared interest, shared interest in the communities um, that sometimes is not seen as much as it deserves to be seen. In my opinion, I think there's so much beautiful things that happen in our communities, whether Chaldean, um, Arabic, uh, you know, Muslim, Christian, uh, others, Mandians, there's so much that happens that I hope that that's what we try to do through these programs is to kind of highlight the beauty of what 
is happening in Michigan, especially with the Middle Eastern community. Um, and so, you know, you being there helps do that. And I know Dunya has been involved in the with them in the past and other friends of mine have as well. Um, so, you know, poets who are starting out, so poetry is not like, um, you know, like it's not a money-making business. <laughs> Sure. It's very yeah. creative and it's like a soul make uh, to me. I think it's like, it's, it's very enriching writing. You know, I feel like when you're doing it, there's such privilege and richness to that. Um, but a lot of writers or poets starting off sometimes don't get the support that they need. Um, this happens often in certain communities because of the fact that we are more like education driven, a career driven things that, you know, on an economic basis, what advice would you give poets? I guess, you know, in general, but particularly towards the communities that feel it's harder for them to kind of steal that time to write because of the, of the push towards education, working, other professions. Uh, what advice would you give these writers? Yeah, I would say, yeah, I mean, I think for all writers, there's an element of like, how do I make space in my life, whether, you know, you have a full-time job or you're raising your children or you're a young person just starting out as a writer. And I do think having some, um, some type of a schedule for yourself, like I know for myself, I get up really early in the morning and write when my house is quiet, right before I have to think about work, right before I look at my email. Um, so I would say make time for, um, for writing in your life. Life. And it could be 20 minutes a day. It could be 20 minutes a month. Um, but finding that space to express yourself, I think, is really important. And then the other thing is to seek out a community. I feel very fortunate to have found my community of writers and artists. Um, when I was a young person, I went to Cass Tech and then I went to Wayne State University. And they were both thriving communities full of um, opportunities for young artists. I think there's even more opportunities now because there's online opportunities, um, there's in-person um, opportunities. And I would say the biggest advice I always give people is to not um, to not give up because um, like, for example, when I received the Kresge Award, I had applied many times before I received it. Um, and I've had a couple of experiences like that in my life where I think, oh, I'm not going to try again um, with this. And then I force myself to because um, our work gets stronger through the practice of writing and those opportunities are there for us. Um, it doesn't matter what background you're from. Um, it's like those opportunities exist and they want people to take advantage of them. And whether you have success immediately or it takes a while, um, it, it does happen. And I just think the biggest thing is find that community of people who can read your work, who can give you feedback, who you trust um, to, to understand what your voice is on the page. Um, so, and I, I think it's important for young people, whether they choose to become a writer as their career, career or not, um, there's value in that expression. And there's lots of people who are, you know, and there's many examples throughout history of people who are doctors, but they also write poetry. Like um, Fadi Judah is a, a phenomenal Palestinian um, poet, and he's also a physician. So um, and he's won the Yale Younger Poets Prize and all kinds of prizes for his poetry while also being a doctor. So I know um, that it is possible to do to do that and and also um, have a career. And so don't give up on your writing um, just because you think you're on a particular path, I think, is the biggest advice. That's excellent advice. Really good advice. I think it's like you're, you know, there's no excuse for anybody. I, even when you, um, I mean, even for ourselves, I think as writers, I have to find the time because I have a full-time job and I have a lot of things that I juggle. So I feel like I'm in that pos the same position. It's like, where do I find this time? How do, and you're right, that 20 minutes, sometimes when it feels like, you know, oh, is it even worth it? Yes, it is worth it. At the Absolutely. end of the day, over an accumulation of days, over ac accumulation of years, yes, that 20 minutes a day is really worth it. And just, you know, to connect with that. 
So Elise, our time is up. I want to thank you so much for joining us today. It was just, it was fun just talking to you and, and, um, and learning from you. And I look forward to our event with the West Bloomfield Library. It's hosted uh, by the Chaldean Cultural, uh, hosted by the West Bloomfield Library in collaboration with the Chaldean Cultural Center. We really appreciate your uh, participation with that. Um, and, you know, everybody, thank you so much for uh, watching. Uh, I look forward to talking to you uh, the next time we publish a book. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you, Weam. It was a pleasure to be here today. Thank you, Adis. Have a wonderful day, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.